Suns fans, you know what time it is in the PHX. Empire of the Suns. Suns. Phoenix Suns. Empire of the Suns. Hello there and welcome to the Empire of the Suns podcast. My name is Kellen Olson, joined as always by Kevin Zimmerman. What's up, man? Hola, how's it going? I guess we're finally into the off season after we kind of entered in, what's the right word? We just didn't know what was happening because we didn't know who was hired as head coach, who was fired as head coach. Now we got a coach, we can thrust ourselves into the off season. There's a draft, they have a draft pick. There's a lot to talk about in the next few months. We'll probably on this podcast kind of cover it in general terms, see where that discussion goes, but we'll definitely like, have some podcasts upcoming here where we're we're diving into draft. It's just six weeks, things. man. Yeah, that's it. Crazy it's late May already. So the draft is a month away. The start of the off season is under six weeks away already. So we're certainly rounding that corner um, as it is. Mike Budenholzer is a new coach of the Suns. We, if you didn't listen to our the full extent of our podcast. Uh, when Vogel got fired, we basically ended that podcast with the news breaking the way it was. And we're like, oh, okay, he's the new coach already. And we yeah. kind of talked about him a little bit as a coach and what to know about him. We'll get a little bit more into that today. Uh, you were at the press conference on Friday. I took a look at it today, listened to the scrum stuff today. Uh, do you want to start with the scrum? What you is there any takeaways from the scrum that also kind of apply to who he is as a coach? What'd you, what'd you think? Yeah, I mean, winning the press conference, a lot of coaches can do it. Um, I think the big thing for me is he said a lot of the exact same things Frank did, to be honest, and and which is good. Frank said the right things. Obviously, the whole reason Frank Vogel didn't work out is because he couldn't implement. He couldn't get guys to, for whatever reason, to connect, to execute like he probably wanted. The The three-point shooting thing, I think, really stands out because the three-point shooting like volume came up over and over again where like it's not even philosophy. It's like you have to shoot threes to succeed in this league, and you have to find ways to make people buy into that. Um, and scheme that. So whether it's scheme or buy-in, that didn't happen too much. Um, but kind of, I think the most revealing thing is he expressed like, and it expressed that he knows how he has to get buy-in is when asked about threes, it was more about, okay, we're going to practice and emphasize shooting threes in practice from individual shooting work to basically like why we're, trying to shoot more threes to get buy-in and there are different levels obviously you can get your team to shoot more threes but it's about getting the right people it's about expressing the why and also working on the skill so i think that was kind of the most revealing stuff but overall like it was more about just his arizona roots and that kind of thing which we we all understood and knew until he spoke about it um Obviously, that came out again with Al McCoy introducing him. So that was a nice moment. But it's that was down cool, to, man. Yeah, we can talk about it being cool. I watched his uh, intro presser in Milwaukee. He was not tearing up then. Yeah. <laughs> so this was a different kind of uh, job. It's a different kind of job for him. I think that it. What I took away from it is that there are direct links of this franchise with his family, specifically his dad. And that is something that makes him emotional. He like yeah. every time he talked about his family, he got choked up uh, during this thing. So it's really cool to see that he has legitimate roots that you could see while he was talking. Like it wasn't yeah. just like I listen to Al McCoy and I used to be Paul Westphal in the driveway. It's like no, like he feels these things still at his age, despite those being things that were like fifty years ago. Um, he wasn't like he made sure to say like I'm sure like Suns trivia wise I wouldn't do well in this room but in like other states as if to say like as a kid growing up like I was a Suns fan but um, since then you know which is perfectly acceptable and what it should be but it was really neat I thought that was cool I am not going to take anything else away from the press conference um, at all that is my prerogative and choice as a human being and <laughs> I'm not going to take anything else away uh, he talked about accountability that was great yeah I think that 
he is someone who is known to get more out of his players than Vogel in that regard. As it is not a high bar to clear, and we need to see if he can uh, clear that bar. I'm not willing to sit here and tell people like the accountability thing is fixed or it looks like it's headed in a good direction. It's like, no, until we can watch this team for 10 to 15 games in a row and tell what they are as a basketball team, I'm not willing to express that there is progress made. If I had to guess, would there be progress made? Yes. But the bar was low, yeah. But the bar was very <laughs> low. Um, so I just, again, reminder of kind of where we are and what he has to do and start with. I did not think when we thought Vogel was going to be fired and we were running through candidates and stuff like that. Can't remember if I said it on that podcast specifically that we did, but I didn't feel like he was a direct match for what they were looking for, and I referenced that last uh, podcast as well with a tweet that Matt Moore had. So we'll just have to wait and see in that regard. The question I have for you is, Mm -hmm. the things that I learned about Bud teams going through and actually like really diving into the numbers after that podcast was he has really good defensive teams most of the time. He is known as an offensive coach, but what he does is build really good offenses off of the backs of really good defensive efforts. So, not what is this is think about the question here. It's not what is going to be easier for them to do. It's like, what do you think is more likely to happen? Do you think that it's more likely that the Suns are a top half defense next year or that they are a top five team and getting up threes next year? Defense because yeah. they were already there under Frank Vogel. Even if there's a little fall off, I just think, again, you erase the the awful bouts of just like maddening basketball where they just weren't whatever you want to categorize not trying and the gap tanking here, their brains yeah sorry the gap here to be clear is top half defense because i think that's more of like a realistic expectation yeah. and top five and three should be an it expectation be. for a team that has three incredible offensive players that should space out the floor every single possession thus yeah. make it much easier to get up threes and they have the shooters to get up threes, and they're going to add more shooting. I will too. say in the presser between him and James Jones, like shooting was brought up a lot. James James was asked. Wise. Yeah, he was asked about what they want to add, and he said shooting first. And it's to me, it's real simple. Again, I've talked about it on this podcast a lot, but if you have a lot more floor spacers and shooters, it's just going to be easier for Book and KD to do well in the mid range. Like. Should KD shoot more threes when he's like shooting above 50% for like a large chunk of the season? Yeah. I would ask him, please take that a little more, be a little more aggressive there. But you can't change and you don't want to change like how they think about everything to that degree. It's just like it, it. the answer is putting pieces around them that do it. And they tried to be fair, like Yuta, they tried to get, um, they had him, Dame Lee was hurt. Um, in theory, he's back. So you just got to reload around them with those shooters. But yeah, I wanted to point that out too. Let's look at him specifically with some of the things we're going to talk about in the offseason before getting into the offseason completely. Mm -hmm. Let's have the point guard discussion right now. Okay. Because I feel like we're all out of orbit, every single one of us. And if you claim that you're in orbit, you're a nutcase. (laughs) And what I mean by that is we have talked about this so freaking much then none of us even know what we're talking about anymore. Yeah. So you and I are going to do our best to explain what we're talking about. And if people can listen to that and understand what we're talking about, and this isn't like a, I got one guy on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. It's like, we're talking about Drew Holiday and Jeff Teague and all this kind of stuff. And you made a good point to me earlier. And it's like, we should, we should kind of rephrase and re-identify what this means and what this discussion means to us. Yeah. Because I think that my main issue with the discussion is that, a lot of people believe it has to be this way, and I don't think it's this way anymore. And here's where I go. A lead point guard in the NBA today more or less does not exist. There are very few of them. This is where I go to what a traditional point guard is. When I think of traditional point guard in my head, I think of like 90s point guards. Like that's where my head is going. Yeah. So I'm thinking of John Stockton. I'm thinking of like Gary Payton. I'm thinking of Jason Kidd. Like those are the point guards that I'm thinking of in my head to be clear. When I say traditional point guard, like Chris Paul obviously Even comes like to mind. Even like a Ricky Rubio. Ricky Rubio, sure. Those just don't really exist anymore. They are they are not dinosaurs necessarily, but they're getting there. And what I mean by that is offenses are so multifaceted these days and 
players are so skilled that there isn't a need for the one smallest guy on the floor to be capable of doing all of the stuff that gets the offense going. And offensive concepts have exploded beyond belief. I'm sure if you showed an NBA coach from 15 years ago what teams were running today and who was running them, it's like, I'm sorry, Boston has two guys that are 6'8", point guards basically that's what they would think yeah they would think that Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown are point guards just based on how much offensive responsibility that they hold but that's not that's not how point guard works anymore like point guard was most directly attributed with the amount of responsibility that the player had in the offense can I can I go to two examples real quick yes Darren Fox if you ask me by size by skill set by passing ability by court awareness is he a point guard? Yes, right? Does he bring the ball up the most? Yes. But do you watch them and see how many times he does not bring up the ball? Other example, Tyrese Halliburton, who may be... Was he the assist lead? Who was the assist leader this year? I should know this. Pretty sure it was him. Is he on the ball all the time when his backup comes in? TJ McConnell, who is more of a traditional point guard? No. Is that an insult to his point guardiness? No. It's just how it is, and it's about fit. It's about how your roster is constructed. To optimize TJ McConnell, you can move Halliburton off the ball because he's good at that too, and it changes how the defense has to play. Anyway, continue. That's that's my quick, like, even guys who are traditional point guards by skill set and, and can absolutely handle it are not used the same way these days. Remember when Harden was an MVP and everyone was like, is he a point guard now? Yeah. It's like he's always going to be a two guard. Like he he was he was he was a two guard, but he was playing point guard. Mm-hmm. And it's like Luca is like a, a three, I guess, but he's playing point guard. Yeah, or he's a two playing point guard. The top five players in assists per game: Tyrese, who is a point guard; Luca, who guards twos or threes. I'm going by who teams guards. Jokic, he guards fives. Harden guards twos or threes. LeBron guards threes or fours mm-hmm. those are the top five guys in assists per game this year it's like point guards just do not i can keep going sabonis <laughs> five <laughs> van vliet one Cade is a two or a three then you got tyus jones and damian lillard point guards devin booker not a point guard chris paul jalen brunson point guard Giannis, not a point guard jamal murray point guard Dejounte, uh, more of a two well, combo D'Lo co- combo, Trey Jones point guard, yeah, Shea co- combo. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's just they, they don't exist. So that is the base of where we're starting here, and what I wanted to lay out is that that is what I mean. So when I'm talking about they don't need a point guard, I'm like they don't need that guy, and everyone acts like they need that guy. It's like those guys are dinosaurs, basically. They're hard they're, to find, and it's not worth. They're they're rare dinosaurs, I guess I should put it as, because I said before, like they're not necessarily dinosaurs, but I believe in some ways that they still sort of are. Um, but part of this conversation again goes back to a philosophical shift that I thought everyone was going to have <laughs> when Chris Paul got traded for Bradley Beal, which is that if Devin Booker and Bradley Beal are in your starting lineup, which is going to happen. That means you do not have room for another guard, really. And they made it work this year anyway with Grace and Allen. But it's more so that if you're going to start a guard, it better be like your best player by a significant margin, the next best player. And and it was. Yeah. Um, But with that being said, you're not going to bring in a guy who is handling the ball again. The example I used in writing is like, do you need Tyus Jones to come up and run a pin down for Kevin Durant? It's like, no, guys. Devin Booker can do that. Bradley Beal can do that. Kevin Durant can do that. It's just the tempo and the chemistry and the cohesion was so god-awful between the three of them. And let's be honest, all three of them were god-awful at running the offense this year. They were really bad at it. And again, I've said this time after time, all this talk about point guard deflects blame off of them. Yeah, They should take a ton of blame for how bad they were and running the offense as a unit together, like or, they deserve, or they could blame the coaches. And like there's whatever, some blame yeah, there. I mean, yeah. Let's let's not go yeah. there. That, that's we're retreading there <laughs> way too much. But yeah. for the sake of the conversation, Drew Holiday, Jeff Teague, Dennis Schroeder, who's the fourth one? Eric Bledsoe, our old yeah. friend. 
those are all four guys who today are are point guards. I would say, like if they have a position, it would be point guard. But are they a true ball dominant? I'm going to run the offense. I'm going to settle everything. I'm going to be the leader. I'm going to be poised. I'm going to make sure we run good stuff. That kind of guy who is the guy that I hear everyone talking about the Suns need to get. They are not that type of player. I think that point guards by trade are that player to some extent. But let me give you an example. Last night's game, Mm -hmm. Timberwolves Nuggets. Did Mike Conley settle that game down at any point? Not not really. Yeah. He, he really didn't do it. It came down to Ant figuring out what he was doing because he is, if anyone's the point guard, it's Ant. Because he is the guy consistently breaking down the, the offense. Again, to go back to the main point of what we were talking about with offensive responsibility and who's holding it the most these days. It essentially comes down to those guys. So it comes down to a combination of those guys, I should say. I would, I would argue... Conley is important for being on the floor and being able to tell Ant and adjust, but he is not controlling the pace so much. He's not doing that. Um, Like, I think there's people who are just like, well, what Chris Paul would have fixed this team. That that's one of the silliest myths out there because they, okay. If Chris Paul was on this team, they'd have the exact same problem against the Timberwolves. Dude couldn't bring up the ball for the two pre or post seasons before that. It doesn't matter that he's a point guard. And even that he knows Jay had to bring the ball up like, yes, that we we can get in this later, but like Chris Paul being traded for Bradley Beal is not the reason that this went South, which people will bring up. And it's like, Nope, he is a true, he is the dinosaur, but his skill set's not even there where it would have made a difference. So you could use the Mike Conley, like, let's settle it down yeah. here. What are your options? Some people are going to say Bradley Beal coming off the bench. He's making 50 plus million dollars a year. He's that doesn't he, how this, this that's doesn't not how this goes. works no. again. We're over here on Earth. You're over there in Neptune. <laughs> I need you to come back to me for a sec. He's just not coming off the bench. It's not happening. Now, let's say the team continues to struggle. He is not playing well. Yeah. And it becomes a real discussion. We'll get there. But we're not there yet. There are times for that to happen. I think that last year, under certain circumstances, if they would have remained healthy and they would have been able to really see the dynamic out, Perhaps they would have arrived at that conclusion. That, like, Didn't, he, he this happened with B- Book and Brandon Knight, correct? Correct. That was like highly paid guy, but just is not playing even close in this atmosphere of making close to that amount of money how your play is. So, we, yeah, we have to get there with Beal. And he played pretty well sometimes. Um, He was... Kind of like fine, yeah. He in the, was in fine. the series, like he was fine. Like he just he had a horrible he had a game. Last four. game, worst game. It was that was his worst game. That probably <laughs> might have been the worst game of his NBA career. Like I'd have to go back <laughs> and watch the all time stinkers for him in the Wizards uniform, I guess. But that was brutal. So, Bradley Beal's not coming off the bench. Basically, you now have to find a very specific point guard by trade. People, As it is. People like to point at the TJ McConnell thing like the Suns could have magically gotten him. Don't understand that either. Pacers weren't giving up TJ McConnell. <laughs> they just, they, they were nothing the Suns would have had anyway. They were not giving up TJ McConnell. No. We talked about TJ McConnell before. Um, I think you and I have both become like they don't need a point guard people identified as this when you and I both came on here at, before the trade deadline and we're like they should probably get a point guard to come off the bench. Yeah. This dynamic isn't really working. They need someone to like and that's exactly the type of guy that they need to look for. It needs to be someone who is okay with completely being off the ball at this stage of their career. Because this guy's either going to have to come in and be on the ball quite a bit or do nothing at all. That's kind of why TJ McConnell actually wouldn't work. Because if he's... Okay. Book comes off. Or, I'm sorry, Bradley Beal comes off. TJ comes in. He's running stuff for Book off the ball... Great. Book comes out. Brad comes in. You're running stuff for Kevin and you're running stuff for Brad. They're on the ball. TJ's off the ball now. And he shoots less than a three a game. Like, you need a very specific type of player for this. Yeah. TJ works in Indiana because he can be on the ball. Because Tyrese can be off the ball. All of that, like, relationship. They don't really have another ball handler. Like, if they had another... 
scorer like Siakam that was more on the perimeter and that was more initiating, then TJ's role would be reduced. He wouldn't be the player that he is right now. So with that being said, you need someone who fits off the ball and you need someone who fits on the ball. So we're, we're, we're not casting a wide net here. It's not happening really. So you're looking for... What are you looking for? I would argue that you would take a TJ McConnell for the sake of and live with it because you wouldn't be utilizing him as best as you could. But you need you need someone who can take just minutes of pressure off of those guys. Yeah, if I could snap a finger and get him for the 22nd yeah. pick right now, I would do it. And the fit wouldn't be there, but yes, it's like he's not the perfect fit for this team. He would play 15 minutes maybe. But that that's the thing is like you don't need a guy who's playing 30 minutes even to no, fill this the, role. The point guard that's going to come in is going to play less than 20 minutes. To the point on Budenholzer and where we're getting to with this, he spoke on this, and this is where I was confused because I was reading tweets and headlines and then I actually listened to all this stuff. Yeah. his My takeaway on his answer in the scrum was very much, like, we're going to need to play without a point guard. It wasn't like both. we need yeah. to get a point guard. It was more so... We're absolutely going to explore the point guard thing. We probably need a point guard. And I think the probably part was a guy on the first week of his job not wanting to speak on front office decisions in front of the media when he's talking to them for the first time. But he did end it by saying, and then he also complimented later in a separate answer, Durant specifically is a playmaker and then Beal and Booker is playmakers as well. And I think the whole point that he was making is what we've been talking about, which is that this offense goes as far as those three take it with them initiating. Mm Mm-hmm. And you need a guy to come in and stabilize every now and then. But this team isn't going to be better if the 80-20 split of Beal and a point guard on the floor is suddenly like 60-40 to that point guard. You get what I'm saying? Like you yeah. don't, you can't have someone that dominant I think on the ball. how I took his answer, I actually liked his answer in that it was, we need options. Like they didn't have, like in the Timberwolves series... You might have given a point, like even a third string point guard, a bigger role just to alleviate the pressure. And um, like if you had an Ish Smith type, for example, in the Timberwolf series, play him 10 minutes a game just to break presses. Just take a give book and Beal a breather here or there. Maybe that's all you do. I know that's like probably not a thing in the playoffs, but that's an example. But of, now they're playing off of him and you're playing. But you have the five. option. Yeah, but that that's that's the trade off here and the yeah. balance that they need to find. Yeah. So it's like, can you get Kyle Lowry on the minimum? Can you get Monte Morris on the minimum? Yeah. I would argue, despite the shooting point that I just made, that Russell Westbrook is like a pretty great fit for the like playmaking that you would want. I know the off-ball value, but I'm talking defense, rebounding. And I'm talking if you can get the defender that he was in L.A. for the most part, if you can get the rebounder that he's always been, in, and if you can most importantly get one of the best playmakers of his generation, to come in there for 12 to 18 minutes a game. Now, would he be okay with an even less significant role than he got in the Clippers? Is that a mutual thing for him with the Clippers? Like, I don't I don't exactly know. I don't know. What about a campaign type who's a free agent and tweeted yeah. about going to D-backs games? Well, that's well, that's the, that's the weird part of this whole thing is that they made the tax move with Cam. They thought Jordan Goodwin was going to be their point guard. They thought the rest of this point guard thing was going to sort itself out. Um, it was clear when Jordan Goodwin, like they had him actually running the offense in the fourth quarter of that Lakers game when everyone was hurt, yeah. that this was going to be a longer process for him and they were going to have to be patient with it and they were going to have to have guys stay healthy and it ultimately didn't really come together that well. Um, but yeah, that's the kind of thing. It's like what, what you think of when a, someone brings up a change of pace guard. Yeah. That's the thing. Anyway, I, I think... I think in general, they just need more roster diversity. And honestly, his answer about point guards kind of gave me more thought on like bigs because it's like you, last year and I wrote this, you had a team that didn't even have one identity as like even culturally didn't, they didn't have an identity. I guess they had an identity as an offensive team, which would be that identity was not very good, <laughs> clunky. Um, but you need multiple identities. And again, going back to the Pacers as an example, like they have different ways to shift what their looks are um, that are part of their regular rotation. The Suns couldn't even get to any bench identity at all. Um, but I think the point guard discussion and the big man discussion could get into like you have different identities 
you can play fast, you can play slow, you can match up big, you can match up small. And I think that was only, that was Bud's point on that. And you just need a more diverse skill set. Like you need someone to dribble the ball up the court better. Absolutely. But that might be the third guard who plays 40 games in a season, honestly. You know what I'm more interested in and something you kind of got to there? Hmm. I'm not really interested in like the correlation of Budenholzer and point guards. Mm-hmm. I'm interested in the correlation of his bigs. Yeah. I know my answer to this, but do you think it can work with Nurk next year? You would... The, the Horford framework would be part of that, but he... Like, Horford was more of a stretch guy. Even in the Atlanta days, that's, you know, basketball light years a, a time ago. I think it can work in that respect, but... Horford took less... He took half a three a game for yeah. his first three seasons in Atlanta, but then his last year with Bud, he took three a game. And then that is when he started becoming more but of a the, the, the league was changing then, too. That was when the um, shift, the Robin, the Brooke Lopez, excuse yeah. me, shift kind of happened, yeah. But I think Bud's interesting because, like, the Milwaukee examples of like Giannis was basically your five when you're thinking about offense because he's the dive man. He's not going to be stretching very much, but even he was asked to shoot occasionally and he would. So yeah, I think Nurk can work. It's just like, you got to put something more diverse around him in the, in terms of fours and fives on this roster. Did I answer your question? What did you ask? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> okay. Fun. I'll take, I'll take sort of. Um, I am thinking of the way to phrase this. I think it works. Um, yeah. Right over me to say a crazy thing? Mm, yeah. Nurk's going to have to shoot again. Yeah. I don't think people want to see it. I think people forgot, for the most part, that Nurk shot 36 from three last year, the year before, whatever you want to phrase it as. Uh, his last year in Portland, he was an average three-point shooter on two and a half a game, three a game, I want to say, two a game, somewhere around there. It's around where he was this year, but he just wasn't making them, and then they just ditched it in January. They're like, no, no, yeah. we're not doing this anymore. And he's just going to need to take two or three of those a game again for this to work, and I think it will. I think, again, the if anyone f- had chemistry on this team, it was him and the big three. Like That was... Yeah. If anyone like showed actual cohesion, it was him and Durant. Like that was the only combo where I really saw any sort of continuity developing. It got better. Yeah. On the floor. Um I will say defensively is is interesting because I do wonder how much of last year, and this is gonna scare people who are really low on Nurkic, like how much of last year was Vogel maximizing Nurkic? Cause he really challenged him to play aggressive concepts and Nurk did fairly okay. Like, again, we're not looking at a guy who's going to be stellar when he plays at the level, um, but he did pretty darn well. His limitations were exposed. Thought in, like, the last 20 games of the year is when he really started to not be as effective as a player. But in the first 40 to 60 games of the year, he was a top 15 center in the league at the very least, and he was probably more than that. Um, I think with him offensively, it it works. I just wonder if they need something just a little bit more orthodox as opposed to an unorthodox player. Like, can you just get Jakob Pertl? Can you just get a pretty good rim protector finishes... Yeah. Set screens. The rim rolling is a big thing. Because Nurk in the short roll was good, but it wasn't used enough. I'm trying yeah. to think of the right way to put it. It wasn't, and maximize is a re- weird word, but. I think short roll is. Too many possessions still ended with him finishing around the basket. Yeah. And it's like, that's the end goal is like to get the large man, the bas- the ball within five feet of the rim. And that should be the goal. So that's where I just always come back to with him. It's like, no matter what he does well, it still comes down to this is your large man around the basket who has to finish, and he can't finish. So can you get someone who is a little bit better, not a little bit better, like better defensively, who just gives you a certified actual 
legitimate room protector who can hold up in basic, like the ABCs, the first three or four defensive coverages you run on a ball screen, that they can handle all of them adequately without a concern coming in. And then that person can just finish around the rim. Yeah. Like, do you just go get Clint Capella? Do you go get um, Jared Allen, I guess, if Cleveland wants to go get weird with it over there after what's been going on over there? Jared Allen's really, really good, so I don't think you're getting Jared Allen. Um, but with that being – Jared Allen's really good in, like, the Rudy Gobert threshold, to be clear. Like, calm down, everyone. I know he can't hit a 14-footer. Rudy can hit a 14-footer, though, now. Hey, now. See that? Jeez Louise. Game sevens are so weird. Yeah. It's like, not only do like the defending champs just completely collapse, but Rudy Gobert outplays Nikola Jokic, like the best player in the world, in the fourth quarter. That was nuts. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, my thinking out loud exercise there is essentially coming down to the end, which is what do you have to give up to get that done? Can you get that done? And I don't think you can. So I think I, I think you're just stuck here. Yeah. And I think you need to save that pick. Uh, or other salaries or other things now. It needs to be a okay. home, yeah, home run if you're going to blow that on. Continue. Gamble and I talked about this. I filled in for him last week. And this is where I'll go with the center thing before we go to other parts of the roster and like the offseason and kind of wrapping up the initial preview here. I'm trying to think of the right example. I guess it is Jared Allen. I don't know why Cleveland would do this, though, but if you could give up the unprotected pick in 31 and Nurkic for Allen, would you do that? I think I would do it. That's like the significant... I'm grading it on a scale of significance. Um, So if you're not familiar, the Suns have the 22nd pick in this year's draft, and then they can also, on draft night, they can trade the 2031 first round pick that they own which they can make completely unprotected they can make a top four protected they can do whatever they want but the appeal here is that you are a contender and you have already completely committed to this thing and you might as well stop until the wheels fall off now a lot of people rightfully so are mad and will say not mad at what i'm saying they're mad at like how this has gone so far and they're like the wheels are already off what are you looking at like they are going to try and salvage this and you got another year at least. I'll give I'll, I, like I I'm not I wouldn't trade the 2031 pick, but if I could get it for that kind of player where yeah. it's like I actually have like a top 10 defense now because I have a really, really good defensive center and I have a finisher around the rim and like a lob threat, a lob threat. Yeah. A lob threat. Let me say that again. A what? A lob threat for (laughs) the guys running ball screens. Um, Again, no shots at Nurk's limitations here, but it's like the the skill set we're talking about. I would heavily consider it, and I would probably do it if I could get the right center in. Like, if I think the right center is there, and it's just that pick in the way, I would give it up. Yeah. You're talking starting caliber player... 30 minutes a game. I'm talking like top 20, top 15 center at minimum who is a perfect fit for the roster. Okay, not perfect because everyone Good. thinks like shooting threes. Yeah. If I get Miles Turner for that pick, I would do it in a millisecond, but that's yeah. not happening, especially after the way Indiana's going off. But that's the kind of example I would give. Like last year, the way we were talking about getting Miles Turner. Yeah. It's like I would have given up the pick last year for Miles Turner. Yeah. Yeah. And that not only changes your rotation, but it changes how you can function as a basketball team. Like, you're a different basketball team immediately in that scenario. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I I think they're going to act that way where if they see some deal like that, you've got to do it. Um, There are a million reasons I think we'll argue, and you'll agree with me, to hang on to that pick and use it on a good player. But if that perfect player who's going to change how your team looks next year comes around, you do it. And you're going to have to blow it up anyway. You're already at that point where if next year doesn't work, if it's as bad as this year, like you're in blow it up mode anyway, you can go find draft picks later. So I think that's kind of the mindset they're in this offseason. Jared Allen's career low for shooting at the rim since getting to Cleveland is 72%. It's like having awful (laughs) having that reliability like he has been percentiles in rim finishing. Uh, 72, 94, 79, 62. Like, great to awesome. Yeah. 
finisher. It's like just having that around these guys would help them have a lot. By the way, a guy who was picked 22nd. If Ooh. You be, if we you can... want to be optimistic about that. Do you want to segue into the playoffs about that? Because... Well, to wrap on offseason, yeah. I think our main, our, the main thing to understand is that they have the 22nd pick, they have the unprotected pick, they have Nas Little's contract, four years, $28 million. You guys might forget, we did an episode, I'm sure, talking about it, like November, like Nas had a good two weeks, and we were like, oh, hey, look, he's going to be in the rotation, that's good, and then his knee just stopped working, and then that was it. Um, he tried to come back, didn't look good when he came back. It, not like physically, he just didn't look good. Like he he didn't play well. Um, but there was like a little stretch in there where they were going through a ton of injuries and he got reps and it was like, you need to play him like eight. There was a game in Portland where he got in there randomly in like the second quarter when they didn't have energy or whatever. And it yeah. was like, you need to play this guy every night now. Yeah. He had one of those games. Uh, and then his knee just was messed up in some way that we don't really know like he was on the injury report it felt like half of the year it was a little less than that but he is someone who is still young four years 20 million sounds like a lot but it is not in today's nba it's not it's an extremely tradable contract um for the length i'm not saying his but his specifically if you attach a first round pick to that you can move it at the very very least and i think even more so you can get the better player coming back for sure yeah that's why there's a pick in it (laughs) so with the whole aggregating salaries thing by the way um do we know so has has marks confirmed the aggregating salaries timeline is right now has anyone confirmed that? I mean, it's basically the new league year, if we want to use NFL terms. So on draft night, can they aggregate still? Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about this. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. There's there's the offseason starting and then there's done. draft night. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Aggregating for them on draft night would be interesting in a few ways, but we'll we'll get to that once we have confirmation. We have to go. This is like I I say like d- did Mark say because like he's the CBA guy and all this and the second apron guy and all this. He knows all the rules and that kind of stuff. We'll look more into that next week. Um, but just to stick with more like the non-aggregation part again, that means that they would have to find basically a salary match for Nas Little and it had to be someone um, above his salary or at his salary or slightly above it because you can't take less money coming back i think is one other way they have to take less they have to take less um they can't take more yeah right that's that's the thing okay so you look at like matches there and there's like a couple of players that kind of stick out but again it's like kendrick williams is one of the guys i mentioned he's not playing for he didn't play for okc in this series that much so you have to be looking at it that kind of way um royce o'neill we've said this We'll say it again. Like, they don't really have a choice. They need to sign him. If they don't sign him, it's vet men guys. Ishbiel will probably do it. You probably. can sign and trade, probably, Royce O'Neal, somehow. Can't sign and trade anymore. Not That's anymore. That's one of the rules. Not anymore? It's one of the rules. They got a lot of them. But again, I don't know when league year starts. I have to find confirmation on that. July. Um. Well, no, like, is, yeah, but... is that actually when this is happening, or can they still aggregate on the draft? I don't know. <laughs> It sounded like Marx was speaking on it like we were we were done already. We we're already here, um, so I'm gonna have to follow up on that. Like I said, but to that point again, so it's not it's trading Nas attached to a pick or it's trading yeah again if you want to upgrade the center spot attaching a pick to Nurk and do you want to upgrade that? Um, the pick itself is at 22. This draft isn't on my very basic viewing. We're going to have Damon Allred on our podcast at some point. If you've been around Suns Twitter and Suns content for the last couple of years, he's been doing draft stuff for a while now. He works for us now. So we just get to pull him in here and get him in that third chair and ask him about Tyone Grant Foster as a potential first round steal and things like that. Um, I'm trying to catch up personally. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, but the big boards and like scrolling through what I was getting to is it's They're not mess. usually the 15 to 40 range. Half of it is older guys. It's not really. It's just a bunch of 19 year olds. The it's, entire draft is a mess. It's just a bunch of 19 <laughs> to 20 year olds. And it seems like what this is going to be the I'm trying to think of like the draft. All the time. Like the Giannis one obviously comes to mind, but the yep. draft where like the three best players were picked 17th, 42nd and 
12th. I, I'm fairly certain that's going to be this draft just based on what I've read yeah. and what I've seen. And it's less to do with like um, dumping on the guys who are like going in the top 10 or whatever. It's just that the unknown of those guys is very comparable to the unknown of the guys in the late teens. Um, but there's a couple of guys out there where they could go get another wing. It's like, I think they need to find it. They basically need to find the Kata Bates, Diop, Utawa, Nabi spot that those guys were supposed to take. They can get that guy at 22. Uh, they can try and sign that guy on the Vets mid again. I don't recommend doing that. I recommend using this pick or using a trade to do that or just having Nas Little or David Roddy try and do it. Probably avoid that too, but that's an option yeah. that they can have. Uh, and then backup five, they got to figure out. I think that if you are drafting at 22, there's a couple of centers there. Uh, there's Ware out of Indiana. There's uh, Misi out of... Baylor, and then there's another kid out of Cameroon. Yeah, Ulrich. Uh, I believe so is his name. Too developmental. Where out of Indiana, like, it's an effort thing. His effort's, like, very red flaggy. Yeah. Missy out of Baylor was a fit, but inexperienced. But there's a rim runner, rim runner shot blocker. Can you figure out a way... Or do you identify a guy who you say, this guy can not only play 17 minutes a night for us like Tra- Trace Jackson Davis did for Golden State or whatever, yeah. but we think that he can be the starter by the end of, like, maybe the end of, if everything goes absolutely well, like, he could start for us by the end of the year, but I expect him to be a starter within two years at the very, very least. Like, that's the type of, if they can identify that 22 at center, they should just take that guy. Um, but then that could be your backup five, or you could sign someone... We like talked about Goga Bataze at the <laughs> deadline. He's around. We talked about Andre Drummond at the deadline. He's around. Daniel Tice. Uh, you just have to get reliable minutes there first, and if second, you can get stylistic fit. Great, but you just need to find someone who's solid. Yes. Can you just solid. get a solid backup five? It's not supposed to be hard. I promise everyone listening. We said how much how easy this is. Just think about the previous teams. Biz was great. McGee was great. I know that in the playoffs it kind of went other directions, but in the regular season at least they were great. Um, and that's where they need to go again. Eubanks has his player option. It sounds like he could accept it. I don't know what to take away from what he told Dwayne Rankin of AZ Central. Uh, but yeah, those are sort of the, that's the bullet point material for the offseason. We can do oh, ugh. we were supposed to talk about Kevin Durant getting traded. We forgot. Shucks. Looks like we're out of time everybody. Oh man. Uh, playoff takeaways, what's up? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm wrong about the T-Wolves guy. Who? The Cat? I've been wrong about the Minnesota Timberwolves in general. Uh, doubting them. Uh, they're a tough team, dude. It was just a thing. They just... They just I like, caught that NBA TV game where they beat up on the Clippers, and I was like, whoa. Uh, in me being right news, the Mavs did have the best trade deadline confirmed. They absolutely did, yeah. The, the P.J. Washington thing is wild, isn't it? Um, yeah. I mean, he's looked really awesome. Gafford and Lively are just an awesome tandem. Speaking of rim rollers, uh, let's see. Tibbs, somehow the narrative on him is not great considering he got all of his players injured. I'm kidding. Like, it's not his fault. That team had bad luck. Pacers are good. I have no idea on the Celtics still until they get challenged relatively. The tips thing will be identified by if Josh Hart can move in three years, if OJ and Newby can move in three years because... Oh, no, he was playing with a bad knee injury and he just kept playing. Yeah. Jimmy never moved the same. Joakim Noah never moved the same. Luol, remember Luol Dang and how good Luol Dang was? Yeah. And then his career just ended immediately. Just just like the Brunson breaking his hand. Like, I know that's just a random incident, but it just it's like really just... Cherry on top of the man. Tibbs just ran this team into the ground. Yeah, like Luol Deng was just like seven years into his career when Tibbs got his hands on yeah. him. Yeah. He was just, he had stints in Cleveland, Miami, the Lakers, and Minnesota, and then Ooh. his career was was over. Former first round pick of your Phoenix Suns, yep. of course, Luol Deng. Who could forget it? Oh, God. You imagine Lil Kel being pissed at Andre Iguodala being on the board? You know how mad he was? Yeah. He was upset. Yeah. He wasn't happy about it. Yeah, same. Um. Yeah, you you were in the same boat, I imagine. The PJ Washington thing is really interesting because everyone who I trust who writes about this stuff and covers a league pretty much confirmed that defensively it was what I had 
the perception that I had had, which is that he wasn't really that good, and he mm-hmm. was kind of all over the place. And then he had the Eric Bledsoe thing, where oh, you're on a good team. <laughs> oh, you you're on a good team, and this is what it looks like when you care about defense. That's great. Um, cause I remember when it happened, Gambo was saying on the air, like just like great defender and all this kind of stuff. I was like, yeah, well, he's not a great defender. Like what, what, what do you mean? And it's like, well, that's what Dallas had in mind and what they envisioned for him. Yeah. And then he played it to perfection. Didn't know he was like an irritant, but he's like a, he's one of those guys. Like anytime a, a kerfuffle's happening, he's in front and he's laughing at the guy that's <laughs> trying to fight him. In Charlotte, he was just trying to tread water and like survive, and now he has the oh, I can do all the little winning guy stuff around and these two. Yeah, I think central. If you're going to take away anything from those series, it's that a lot of what basketball comes down to, and this is sort of unfortunate because of the way. Uh, that I want to see the game kind of played and the way that it just kind of devolves now, which is matchup hunting, one-on-one switching, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of it does boil down to how your shooters are going to perform. And I think that Dallas just got the right mix without a shadow of a doubt. And like the, in that series, Exum, who didn't really play that much, uh, so never mind on him, Derek Jones Jr., 37 from three Josh Green 37 from three percent excuse me that's 27 attempts for both those guys Mm -hmm. Uh, and then PJ Washington shot 47 he was 23 of 49 um, in that series and then Luca was 39 on like the type of threes that he normally takes which is great and then Kyrie again we're talking about Kyrie like pull-up threes he shot 42 percent so they shot 39.7 as a team OKC was the best shooting team in the league for the most part this year and they, I think, ended up somewhere around 33 or 34 for the series. And guys like j not hitting threes. Um, I think Shea was really the only guy on the team outside of Chet that was hitting their threes this series. Like Isaiah Joe wasn't, didn't really have a great shooting series. Wiggins didn't. Um, Wallace? I don't even know. Wallace, I think, actually did. You're right. I think he was high 30s. Um, but there's someone else I'm forgetting. Dort was kind of fine. Yeah. He was okay. But... Point being, a lot of this devolves down to those guys and taking shots, which is why, again, importance of Grayson Allen, I'm going to continue to say, and importance yeah. of Royce O'Neal specifically, um, those types of guys and finding one or two more of those who can hit shots. And I think why James Jones keeps mentioning uh, shooting. But PJ, again, that's a great example of... What happens get when them, you have two stars? Get them in your ecosystem. Yeah. Do you have that kind of thing where it can make their game better? You look at how good Lively's been right away. Like, if Lively was drafted by all 30 teams this year, he would have been good. But would he have been this good? No, because he gets to be Luca's lob threat. Like, it's perfect. Luca made Dwight Powell that guy. A lot of why Amazing. we were lower on Dallas besides, like, the we were worried the locker room was going to explode concerns were everyone outside of their, like, top three guys. Center specifically was one we were worried, and they trade for Gafford, and Lively's awesome right away. It's like, yep. okay, that yep. does it. Uh, Minnesota, I was, I really liked them um, when I caught them in the on the back half of the season, and they were in my, I still think it's Denver, but I'm going to, Minnesota might be my next team I mention after Denver. That's where I was at for them. Um, but I also just didn't think that Cat was going to be able to get over his stuff, that Gobert was going to be able to get over his stuff. Jane McDaniels suddenly is doing offensive stuff now in important moments. Yeah, The matchups there, Cat being able to defend Jokic, which allowed Gobert to kind of stay on the floor. Aaron Gordon was shooting threes and confidently taking them and hitting them, which was like, uh-oh, Nas the Gobert playing... thing's yeah. happening again. He's yeah. going to get played out the floor because Gordon's hitting threes, and like that's what you have to live with because you have Gobert on the floor. But then... Uh, Kat just defended Jokic so well and then for the most part stayed out of stayed out of foul trouble with like the biggest exception in the world because we know he's going to get in foul trouble yeah kind of thing uh Ant was pretty good in that series um I thought that he was much better against the Suns and I think that especially breaking down the defense I'm really interested to see how he handles Dallas because they are gonna kid is going to make him make the reads yeah and that that's where that game was going. Game seven was going in the direction of 
and needs like three more years to figure out how to break down defenses and we're still pretty much there but it was the first like oh he's 22 yeah and we need to remind themselves um of that but yeah i mean it was the same term rules stuff we've seen all year where it was yeah gobert and mcdaniels are playing or uh cat and mcdaniels are playing awesome almost the whole game and then Nas makes a couple of huge plays conley makes a couple of huge plays gobert makes a dozen huge plays in the fourth quarter yeah and it's like yep just having six or seven awesome players is how quite the advantage the fact that cat goes out in foul trouble and Nas comes in and changes the game Nas played it's really like, good defense who, in that that luxury is insane yeah yeah Nas was great he's He's the man. I'm. Um, I'm happy that the Nas Reed experience is out there. Who do you have still? Is it? Is it still? So is it Celtics now for you? Because I picked. Oh. I believe I had one, two, one, two. I had Nuggets and Thunder, and then I had Celtics and Knicks. I don't remember who I had out of the West. Who did I have out of the West? Did I have Denver? We don't need to worry about that. I am worried about the Celtics just because I think there's a lot of value in in being tested at least a little bit. Yeah. And definitely Minnesota has gotten past that. Whoever comes out of the West, I think, is going to win. So right now, I'm going to check this right now, but as of this moment, the Celtics are by far the favorites to win the title right now. They are minus 150. So that means that... Vegas is telling you that if it's Celtics or the field right now, that you should take the Celtics. I do not agree with that. I think it's the field, and I think the Pacers actually have a shot. Yeah. Porzingis is that's Porzingis why. is out. Yeah, I think like it's easy to kind of skip past that and remember like this isn't the full Boston team. This isn't the full experience. They're still really really darn good. But I thought Tyrese figured some stuff out. Mm-hmm. I thought that especially defensively, from like the back half of the series on, he was really good. Um, like TJ is going to be an issue for them. He's been an issue for everyone so far this year. And I think that Boston specifically, once those other pieces start to come in, I think it was, it was either Tyrese or Carlisle or Miles Turner or someone. And it was just like, like what's the best part of like your team or whatever. And it was like our bench. Like we just have the yeah. be- best bench. I in mean, the league. It's, it's the 2021 Suns formula where you have these multiple identities who carry you you're not just leaning on that group of starters i don't know what the benches the the celtics bench exactly is it's not that dynamic i guess is the word Mm -hmm. dynamic benches get you a long way but obviously you got to have the stars so we'll see that's an interesting take though yeah because like that the odds are basically based off oh yeah they're gonna beat the pacers and it's like if they don't then i don't know if we talked about it much on this podcast but i still need to see it with Tatum, I'm going to be that guy. Yeah. I still feel weary about putting him down as a top 10 player. feel like he's incredible, but at the same time, like this level that I think he's going to need to get to to win them a championship, but don't know yet. And ditto on, ditto on Brown. I've been, I'm apprehensive of them both, but I think this is like their, you want know, to talk about Kevin Durant legacy moments. Like this is like, yeah. You've been waiting with this Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown thing for them to get you a title for a while now, and this is their perfect. This is like, if they're who they're supposed to be, then... It's fine, yeah. They win it, yeah. Uh, God, I want to pick the Pacers. I'll go... I'll go Celtics in seven. I think it's I think it's actually going to be a real war. Like, I think... Do you think... Dude, like... Even if Chris Tapps is back and he's playing well, like Miles Turner's probably the best big in that series, right? Like he's been awesome. Miles Turner's been so good. Yeah. Remember when oh, I wish pace... I wish I wish Ben was healthy. I would pick them if Ben was healthy. That's a lot of people forget that about their team. Like they're mm-hmm. they're missing their their six man. They're like their best. Yeah. One of their better scores. Um yeah, I'll go I'll go I'll go Celtics in seven. Yeah, I'll go Celtics in six. I have no idea on the West. I, I think I want to pick T Wolves. Yeah, give me Minnesota in six. Okay. I'll go in seven on that one. Just to diversify. I changed my mind. Uh oh. Mavs in seven. Okay. I think Ant needs another year against a defense like that. I think their defense is too good. I think Lucas Lucas has been like, I'm playing defense. 
<laughs> but then for two quarters, he's just not playing defense, you know? I'm not complaining! The funniest thing in game six was he got fouled when he, like, took a three, and he looked at the ref, <laughs> and he was about to say something, and then he remembered in his head, like, I'm not saying anything to refs anymore, so he went... He just made one of those kinds of faces at the ref instead of saying something. Oh, it was so good. He's he's in, he's insane. Um, but to that point, Kyrie has actually been doing the work, and Kyrie's been this yeah. is the most like well-rounded Kyrie's ever been. He's been incredible. If PJ Washington and Derek Jones, I'll add the caveat: Madison seven. If Derek Jones and PJ Washington shoot thirty-five percent from three or above, which I'm just going to expect is what's happening now. But there's a very good chance that doesn't happen because that's not what those guys have been for the most part. Minnesota bothers you. They get under. They've gone under two pretty good offensive teams. I guess the Suns, you can judge me on that. So does PJ guard Cat? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll go I'll go Mavs in seven, but I wanna okay. I'm gonna add the caveat there. I need I need that assurance because that is how that team works to me but yeah so i'll go oh man people are gonna hate a mavs finals aren't they if, if yes. they make the finals yes they are oh, they're, they're, mavs celtics like suns that. fans especially will just be over it i know the quality like the actual games themselves mm-hmm. was like game to game basis not a bunch of like close finishes or whatever but i thought the quality of basketball was still super high yeah and it was like did game six denver um minnesota kind of suck as a game, I guess, but Jokic like punked a dude on national television and it was incredible to watch. I think like same thing for these two series. I still think the quality of basketball is high enough and I think Indiana is like, like they are, they're plus 2,800 to win the title right now. It's like they need to win two series. Yeah. It's not like, it's not insane to me. I don't know, especially with what the Celtics have shown, which is like, Ah, we just kind of mess around and lose games sometimes that we shouldn't, whatever. Yeah. That, that doesn't come back to bite teams ever. You can do that when you're that good, though. Okay, so what are we doing? What are we doing in life? No, what are we, like, what are we, are we, are we coming back next week? Are we coming back in a couple of weeks? What are we doing? So the draft is late June. We're talking to you in the third week of May. Let's plan in front of the people right now. Do you want to have a draft podcast next week? Do you need more time? to catch up oh let's yeah let's wait please don't do that <laughs> we can go through scenarios of trade or no trade roster construction i have no idea let's just say we're going to be back at the start of june okay does that sound good like we'll be back sure start of june second week of june maybe let's lower the expectations and then if we feel like we we'll, get we'll be back for the finals let's put it that way okay like we'll be back for the finals and then if we'll we see feel, if there are any if we other... feel like doing anything with a great idea we come up with, we'll pop up and surprise you sooner. Did TJ Hushman Zada hear that oh. Kevin Durant <laughs> is going to, like, you know, like, see what I did there? Cedric did Benson, a- did he hear anything? Does AJ Green have a podcast? Yeah. <laughs> did, uh, oh, why can't I think of Tyler Eifert? Did he hear anything? Tyler Eifert. Andrew Whitworth? Andy Dalton? Any other Bengals here or anything? Is Andy Dalton done playing? I don't even. Yeah. I'm just trying to like, news wise, <laughs> nothing's going to happen in the next month unless you want to source an NFL receiver hearing that Kevin Durant wants to come somewhere. So I think that's where we're at. I think I, I think I feel good about telling the people we'll be back in June. Yeah. Okay. Enjoy the basketball, everyone. As you can tell, we are. It is good basketball. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone.